Greetings, citizens of Earth. Stephen Colbert here, appearing in my capacity as the host of the Global Citizen Festival. It's happening September 26th in New York Central Park, and my co-hosts, Hugh Jackman and Selma Hayek, couldn't be here today because they have careers. But one assumes they would want me to tell you how you can get tickets and see artists like Ed Sheeran, Coldplay, Pearl Jam, and Beyonce. Now, as I told you in my previous comment eligible video, the goal of the Global Citizen Festival is to mobilize people to fight inequality, protect our planet, and to end extreme poverty by 2030. And you were bragging because you lost 10 pounds after New Year's. <laughs> Here's what makes this festival different. Tickets are not on sale for any price. Sorry, Bill Gates, your money's no good here. You've got to earn your way in by taking selfless action to help humanity. So in Bill Gates' case, that would be the billions he's donated to fight poverty and disease. See you at the show, Bill. To find out how you can earn free tickets, go to globalcitizenfestival.com and choose the cause that means the most to you. Here's the cause that means the most to me, girls' education. See, growing up, I knew many girls. My mother was a girl once. And I believe giving girls equal access to education worldwide is not only the right thing to do, but saying so might make Beyonce like me. To guarantee that all children everywhere have the chance to get 12 years of free, safe, and quality education, we need the Global Partnership for Education to get enough cash to disperse at least $15 billion a year by 2020. Here's how we're going to get this done. We're using Twitter to invade Norway. Okay, technically, we're sending tweets to Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg. You see, Norway is a leader in funding education worldwide. And if they agree to increase their support for the Global Partnership for Education, the rest of the world will follow. Norway has always been a trendsetter. I mean, just look at the Vikings. They were into ridiculous beards way before Brooklyn. So we're asking Norway to give $100 million a year for the next five years. And to help guarantee education for all, register to be a global citizen on the website and tweet at Erna Solberg and ask her politely to increase funding for the Global Partnership for Education using the hashtag education for all. And if you decide you're too busy to help, that's okay. You won't just be disappointing me. You'll be letting down Pakistani Nobel Prize winner Malala Yousafzai, who's lobbying governments all over the world to make this happen. Oh, sorry, Malala. Uh, I couldn't tweet to help you. I was too busy Instagramming my grilled cheese. We all have to answer to our own conscience. Come on. Folks, to prove to Norway how sincere I am about wanting their help, right now I'm going to end this video by eating this plate of lutefisk while listening to Norwegian death metal. Hit it! Mmm. 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 Oh, I promise to try to eat that later. Mmm. My goodness. That has a fishy aftertaste. I'll see you all at the festival. Thank you, guys. Well, I'm really Thank excited to be here us. with you. He's, uh, he's one of the people doing such amazing things in the world, and I'm also proud to, uh, to call him a friend as well. But first of all, how did you get Stephen Colbert to, uh, to do that video? Well, I, I asked him, and I... I, I um, <laughs> Is it that easy? <laughs> well, I mean, he's, he's an amazing man. I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are fans of Stephen Colbert, but I'm a huge fan. You've got a few I've, of them I've always here. found him to be. Isn't he awesome? And uh, <laughs> I, uh, so, so earlier this year, we reached out to him and we said, we want you to co-host the festival with Hugh Jackman and Selma Hayek and Olivia Wilde and many of, the, many of our good friends at Global Poverty Project. And he said, come on in, we'll have a meeting. And we talked all about girls' education, which actually is his passion. He said, I want to support the cause that won't necessarily get the most funding because Many causes like, say, HIV AIDS or polio eradication have had a lot of attention, but girls' education is chronically underfunded globally. He said, I want to get behind that. And so we said, okay, how are we going to do that? We talked through the political strategy of getting Ernest Solberg, who we met with last week in Norway, on board. And uh, wow. we talked through the whole strategy, and he got so excited. He said, okay, I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going to create a video 
In fact, he created two videos about this and he's going to create even more uh. try to encourage. And it was so impactful. Like, uh, it was and amazing. And this is a great, I mean, this is, I think, what's, what's great about you is you want to create big impact and you're able to leverage someone like Stephen Colbert for real results. Like, and we're not even talking about raising a million dollars. We're talking about really a global impact. What, so what has the outcome been so far from that video? So and in, by the way, was the uh, was the was Erna was she upset with the uh, the attention she received on Twitter? She she was a bit overwhelmed with the attention <laughs> she received. I mean, it got written up in uh, the New York Times. It was published in the Daily Beast. It was published everywhere. And so um, last week, um, the the Norwegian government invited us to Norway. So we went to Oslo. We met with her uh, last Wednesday, and she said to us when we sat down, she said. I've been given 57,000 tweets wow. in a few days. She said, I've had about 17,000 phone calls from global citizens all over the world. I've had 22,000 emails in the space of just a few days. This is the impact of global citizens all over the world doing this. And she said, I really want to help. I'll come to the festival and I'm going to invite other world leaders to come with me. And so she's already made that commitment, which is Amazing. awesome. So, so. Amazing. <laughs> So the other side of that is no one should mess with you because you can leverage people to get 17,000 people to call someone as well. So we, we well, pretty much have to do what you want. Not, not me. It's the whole movement. <laughs> you know, like we, we're so fortunate. Global Citizen has now grown to have 6 million members around the world. And um, we're growing by hundreds of thousands of members every single month. So like if you, if you go to the front page of globalcitizen.org, you can literally see people taking action every second of the day right now from all over the world. Like later at night, you see India comes online. You see all the Indian flags right now. You'll see American flags up the top, you know, and then occasionally you get the Australian flags for me thrown in. So it's like people all over the world are taking action, which is cool. Amazing. And I like to say I knew Hugh before all of this because uh, he had just moved to the U.S. five years ago. And I want to say we bonded over something. I was really impressed. Hugh was telling, you know, it's not every day you meet someone that wants to tackle an issue that's affecting 1.2 billion people. Um, but I had this little problem where on airplanes I start to sob when I watch random movies. <laughs> and I had kept this secret my whole life. Um, I knew I had a problem when I was watching Big Mama's House and I started crying. <laughs> Um, on an airplane, only on airplanes. And for some reason it came up at dinner and then he was like, that's so crazy. I sob on airplanes also when I, I'm watching movies. I don't remember what movie I, you told I me you sobbed out, over. I think it's an altitude thing. <laughs> I, no, honestly, I, I read somewhere that if you're at higher altitudes, no, I'm serious. I, I, th I think We're very emotional people. <laughs> she doesn't believe me. <laughs> no, I think it literally it makes you more emotional when you're at higher altitudes. At least it does with me. Yes. So. <laughs> so he's doing great things, but he's also a very normal, uh, down-to-earth guy. And, you know, when I met Hugh, I think their staff was like four to five people. They were in a borrowed office. This is long before the, the concert was happening. But you already had this passion for trying to fight and end uh, extreme global poverty, which, by the way, is measured as people living under $1.25 a day. That's what, what the issue that Hugh's trying to tackle. And there's, one, there's over a billion people living in that kind of poverty in the world. But where did this start for you? Because I know your childhood was, I mean, you were sort of like a prodigy of, of sort of trying to tackle these issues. How did this all start? You're from Australia. And I think you were, were you Australia's youngest man of the year, uh, man of the year, or something like that. Something, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, so I grew up in, the, in Melbourne. Has anyone here been to Melbourne, Australia before? Not yet. Well, you must Not come. Not yet. No Melbourne people? Well, well, we'd love you to come. And so I grew up in, in the leafy suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. And uh, at the age of 12, this lady from a charity came and spoke at our school about raising money to support um, projects in the developing world. And she talked so passionately about extreme poverty that I put up my hand and I said, I'm going to start raising money. And so when I was 12 years old, I started literally door knocking on all my friends' houses, raising as much money as I could. And when I was 14, I became the highest fundraiser for this charity in the country wow. and so and so uh, wow. <laughs> I don't want to think about what I was doing at 14 but <laughs> it was not as the highest fundraiser in the country and and so so what happened was they, they sent me to the Philippines um, to see their work firsthand and I, I won this competition to go to the Philippines and there was one night that really changed my life forever where I was taken into this slum in the center of um, Manila, which is uh, a community called Smoky Mountain. It's an entire community built on top of a rubbish dump. So the whole community revolves around scavenging. And so the children run after the garbage trucks every day and try to get bits of scrap metal, piece of food and things that they can recycle. And uh, 
That night, I was placed in the care of a kid my own age. We were both 14 at the time. His name was Sonny Boy, and he'd grown up in Manila, and he'd lived his whole life on this slum. And that night, he took me to his house, and, you know, I was so naive. I didn't know what to expect, but when it came time to go to sleep, he cleared away the pots and pans, and we lay down on this concrete slab the size of half my bedroom with seven of us in this long line, and we lay there with this smell of rubbish all around us because we're lying on top of a garbage dump and cockroaches crawling all over us, you know, and... And I, could, I didn't sleep at all that night. I, I lay awake staring at the roof of this small shanty hut thinking to myself, you know, it really is pure chance that I was born where I was born and he was born where he was born. Our roles could have very equally been reversed in life. We don't deserve where we're born, you know. And so I, I said to myself that night, I said, I'm going to see if I can commit my life to doing what we can to end extreme poverty by 2030. And um, I came back and I, I told my mum and it was a reaction. <laughs> she wasn't. She wasn't super cool about it. Like she, <laughs> she I, I said to her, "I want to go live in India. I want to work with Mother Teresa's orphanage and the projects in the slums of Delhi." And she said, "You know, Hugh, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into?" And I said, "Mum, of course I do. I'm 15 years old. Come on, you know." And I, <laughs> I started trying to persuade her, and eventually she let me go. So the following year, I trudged off to India by myself to live in the Himalayan mountains of India, a small town called Masuri. Um, in, in Uttarakhand, northern India, and I, I, I worked at a school that are called, uh, actually called Woodstock School um, in northern India, and then each weekend would come down and try to volunteer with, uh, with Mother Teresa's Orphanage, Sisters of Charity, or the Disabled Children's School in Delhi. And so that was really a formative year that set me on this path that I said, I, I want to dedicate my life to this to see what we can do. And the more I've read, and, and I studied economics as a background, I, I, I was trained as a lawyer, I... I, I went through my academic career, but the more I learned, the more I realized it actually is possible to end extreme poverty within our lifetime. It's not a fanciful idea. And the great news already is that while I've been alive, extreme poverty is already halved in our world from 52% of the world's population living in extreme poverty back in 1981 down to 25% of the world's population today. That's all happened within our lifetime. And so it, amazing progress has been made. The question is, can we end it all together in the next 15 years? And I think we're going to, right? We're going to. I mean, this is a really historic year for our movement. 2015 is the biggest year by far. And the reason is because what happened was in the year 2000, all of the world leaders came together to New York City and they agreed upon a plan to halve extreme poverty by 2015 called the Millennium Development Goals. And that plan expires this September. And the reason why we're hosting the Global Citizen Festival on Central Park this September um, is because it coincides with that same meeting of world leaders this September. So this this September, you're going to have the Pope's going to be in town. You're going to have... Will you he know, be at the festival? No, he's in Philadelphia he's that in day. He's in Philadelphia we, that we, day. <laughs> we, uh, we spoke to his team. Um, and um, uh, President Obama's going to be in town. You're going to have 190 world leaders in town that week. And the whole focus is on the announcement of this new set of goals, not just to halve extreme poverty, but to end it all together by 2030. And that's what... We're getting the, what's what world leaders will come together at the United Nations to agree upon on September 25th. That's amazing. Yeah. And so, you know, with this concert, with everything you're trying to do, it's really about mobilizing people, right? It's really about bringing attention to this and mobilizing them. And so, w where did that start for you? Because I know, so you were doing all this work in your youth. When did you decide to come to the U.S.? And was that related to how you're? I know you seem to have an outlook about how do we get people in the world to really care about something. When, when did that idea become planted for you? So um, when I was 19 years old, I uh, returned from a year living in South Africa. I was living at an orphanage in KwaZulu-Natal outside of Durban, um, an orphanage for about 100 children who'd been orphaned by HIV AIDS in the region. And I came back to Australia and was really passionate and said, and I started a charity called Oak Tree, and Oak Tree was entirely run by young people and it grew to become the largest youth-run charity in Australia. But no matter how much money we raised for education, because we were funding schools around the world, we wanted to build schools and, and, and train teachers and build libraries around the world. No matter how much money we raised, we knew, we knew it was a drop in the bucket for the 1.2 billion people living in extreme poverty. And so when I was 20, 21, uh, still studying at the time, we saw, we saw that the G20 world leaders, so 20 of the biggest economies, their finance ministers and prime ministers were coming to Melbourne for their annual meeting. And so we decided we wanted to run a concert called the Make Poverty History Concert. We'd been inspired by what Bono and 
Bob Geldof had done with Make Poverty History in the UK. So we said, let's bring it to Australia. So we had this idea to run this small concert. And we got all these local Australian artists involved. And then one day, I was literally studying in the library. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call from Bono's manager and, and from Bono's team. And they said, hey, he said, hey, boys, Bono's coming to Melbourne and he wants to perform at your Make Poverty History concert. Is that all right? And I was like, <laughs> I was like of course that's all right. And then, and then he said, and he wants to perform with Pearl Jam. Is that okay? And I'm like, okay. And I, I, thought, I thought it was a prank call. Like, I didn't believe it. Like, I ran out of the library and I, I called my girlfriend at the time. I'm like, I can't believe it. I think Bono and, and Pearl Jam want to perform at my concert. <laughs> and so... And who is performing before those guys? Well, I mean, amazing Australian artists. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you, you may not have heard of them, but I mean, I'm huge fans of them. But like, amazing artists like John Butler Trio and, and, and Missy Higgins. Incredible local talent. But no, no one of that of that sort of... Uh, global reach, and so I was pretty blown away. And anyway, they they did come along. They performed "Rockin' in the Free World" by Neil Young, and uh, it ended up being broadcast all over the world. And so a million Australians got behind the Make Poverty History movement, and it was so successful. There were so many, both you know, everyone from you know students through to soccer mums were behind the movement. It was so successful that um, we managed to convince the Prime Minister of Australia to double Australia's foreign aid levels. So we secured $6.2 billion for the world's poor back in 2007. And so when Prime Minister Kevin Rudd was elected as Prime Minister, he attributed our movement was the reason that he decided to make this commitment because you know every major organization from Oxfam through to World Vision through to UNICEF were all working together behind this movement called Make Poverty History. So that was where it started and I thought, you know, uh, after that, we got a phone call from the United Nations here in New York who said they wanted to help us take you our work. You get a lot of good phone calls, by the way. Well, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's Bono. How's it going? <laughs> I, I, I was genuinely shocked by that one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, and now you come to the U.S. to take this sort of to the next level. And by the, I, so I was sitting with him before the concert, and he's like, Tim, I have this, this idea. It's a concert. People t we won't sell tickets. People are going to have to take action to attend the concert. And I'm sitting there going, oh, this sounds like a pretty cool idea. And now it's, it's this. Um, you can't buy tickets to the concert. You have to take action. And it's been just as unbelievable success. Will you walk us a little bit about the, the first concert? This is the third concert now. Fourth, the actually. Fourth concert. Yeah. Time is flying here. It is flying. We're getting older, mate. But um, why did you think that was going to work? And, and why is it working? You, you, how many people have you mobilized now? Well, I mean, honestly, the first year was very hard. Um, I, my wife and I moved to New York back in 2010. Um, we got married a week before. We had our quick honeymoon and, and moved straight to the U.S. And, and we had this dream. And we, our dream was by the following September, we arrived in the September. So we gave ourselves a year to get the first concert off the ground from arriving in New York. And I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. I thought, <laughs> I, I originally, like, because I didn't realize that no one had done a concert on the Great Lawn since like Simon and Garfunkel back in 1981 and Bon Jovi a few years later. And so they'd never granted a Saturday. And so we had to meet, we met with Mayor Bloomberg's office. We met with everyone we possibly could. And we, and we had to raise so much money to pull off the first one because we give away all the tickets for free. So everything has to be sponsored, right? And so, and so we, like, we had to raise millions and millions of dollars because New York's expensive. And, uh, and what was so, Bloomberg's reaction, by the way, well, when you presented this to him? Well, amazingly, they said yes. Like the Parks Department of New York City was so supportive. They're like, okay, we'll do it. You know, it has a hefty price tag. You've got to realize how expensive it is, but we'll, we'll get behind you. And so we, we had this big dream and the Foo Fighters were the first band to commit. And so, so Dave Grohl and their manager, John Silver, got behind it in a big way. We, and then the Black Keys got involved, and then Canaan, Band of Horses, but we still really wanted Neil Young in year one. And so we, because, because, because Dave Grohl said it would be cool to get Neil Young involved in this. And so at that stage, it wasn't really confirmed until a month before the festival was about to start. And then all of a sudden we got a phone call from Neil Young's manager who said he'll take a meeting with us. He, we went to his office in Los Angeles. He, he put Neil Young on the phone to us. Wow. And Neil, Neil's like, Learned all about it. He said, I, I agree with this. I'll get behind it. And so thanks to those guys, year one was a huge success. And so we thought it was going to be a one-year concert. We didn't plan it to be an annual event until as soon as that year finished, Stevie Wonder called us. Stevie, Wonder, <laughs> Stevie Wonder's you managed. You do a show on the phone calls you receive. 
I'm glad you answered the phone when I call. With yeah. People calling you. <laughs> well, well, it was it was Stevie's Stevie's agent, Rob Light, amazing man, amazing man, and he called and said Stevie wants to headline year two, and we were like year two. We didn't think there was going to be a year two, <laughs> and so and so we then had to put the build up the engine and start to build it. And so then so then Stevie Wonder, Kings of Leon, Alicia Keys, John Mayer, you know, they all started to get involved in year two. And then year three, Jay-Z said he wanted to headline with no doubt Carrie Underwood, Fun, The Roots, Tiesto, um, Sting, and a whole lot of artists. And then now the momentum's just building. And awesomely, Chris Martin from Coldplay has just made a 15-year commitment to Global Citizen. He said wow. he wants to help us Amazing. curate the festival for the next 15 years. So huge shout out wow. to him, Mike. So yeah. Amazing. Can I just answer your phone for like a day? <laughs> That's all it's, I want. It's not, a, it's not as exciting as Hughes, it is. Hughes, Hughes not here right now, but if you want to come perform a concert for me, I'm down. <laughs> so what, if people want to attend the concert, you know, obviously they can go to globalcitizen.com. And what, what kind of actions are you asking people to take? Yeah, so, so we believe at Global Citizen, our whole philosophy is that charity alone is good, but it's not going to end extreme poverty alone. You need to also mobilize people en masses to get the governments of this world and the businesses of this world to also play a big role. Because if you talk about extreme poverty and you try to reduce it just to monetary terms, you're talking about a $260 billion a year challenge. So no amount of black tie gala dinners is going to solve that. You know, we need to be thinking differently. We need to be getting, you know, world leaders involved at the highest level. And so the way that Global Citizen works is we try to use the power of our membership, six million people coming together and using their collective voice to encourage world leaders to do things that are extraordinary. And so, for example, like what Stephen Colbert did, we want to, we, last week we encouraged Norway to get involved. This week, uh, just today actually, our team is in Sweden meeting with the Prime Minister of Sweden to try to get him to step up because he's made this big declaration that he's the first feminist government in the world. They want to have a greater representation of women in their government than men. And that's fantastic. And so we said to him, well, put your money where your mouth is then and actually support girls' education, support water and sanitation efforts that often affect women the most in the developing world. And so that's what today's meeting is about. Um, we've invited, we're doing a big shout out next week. We're trying to invite Vice, Vice President Joe Biden to come and make a big commitment on behalf of the US government. So really it's all about collective mobilization, but also we want to connect global citizens with the best charities that are taking the most effective actions. So we partner with UNICEF, we partner with CARE, we partner with PLAN, we partner with the One Campaign, we partner with Save the Children, we partner with the United Nations Foundation. These are all of our core partners, and we give global citizens the opportunity to go and support the causes that you care about. So if you care about girls' education, you can take action on Global Citizen about that. If you care about food security for children, then we can go and talk about that. If you, if you care about, say, you might have a specific issue that is, say, eradicating polio or preventing HIV AIDS, all of those issues are on Global Citizen, and we connect you with the best charities that you can take action on. Cool. Can I show people your T-shirt? Okay. So this is cool, but this is uh, one of the new T-shirts from the festival. I was trying to do this backstage. You wouldn't let me. But this was actually designed by... Ed Sheeran. And Sheeran so, designed this Global Festival shirt. And uh, I'm assuming he called you and told you he wanted to design a shirt for you. No, no, we, this is more of a discussion. This is more of a discussion. <laughs> but you said you had some other people designing apparel. And, and right. how do we get cool stuff like this as well? Right. So, yeah, so Coldplay has designed a T-shirt as well. Um, and um, they're in all the H&M stores around the world. So if you go to H&M starting September 2nd, um, you can get all your Global Citizen swag. And, um, awesome. And it's, uh, there's like festival swag as well. But um, this one is, yeah, Ed Sheeran's designed this one. And then Coldplay have got one. And then um, we're working with all of our artists to design um, amazing things leading up the festival as well. So um, it's, I, mean, it's, I just love the artist's creativity and, the, and what they bring to it, you know. Every, I'm really excited when you'll see Hugh Jackman and Stephen Colbert on stage. Yes. That's going to be very exciting. <laughs> so, Amazing. And, and I hope you guys can all come. Like, I don't know if any of you have applied to come to the festival, but you have? Oh, you got tickets. Nice, nice. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great.
Yeah, I mean, we, we would love to have you all there. So um, yeah, just go to Global Citizen. There's still two action journeys left. So if you go on quickly, there's still uh, in the order of about 10,000 tickets that are still going to be given away over the next few weeks. So go on quickly. Yeah. Awesome. And that's a great transition to uh, our audience questions. But this has been fun. And uh, let's see uh, our audience. They got some questions for you. Hey, good morning. Um, as this Olympic medalist said, you started <laughs> from a very, very young age. But my question to you is, can you remember that particular moment where you were like, wow, like, I can't believe this is happening, just in general? Yeah, I do remember that moment, and it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, I remember it very vividly. I was 15, and I was in India, and I was living at this school called Woodstock in the Himalayan mountains, and one day, we had to do a trek to the top of the mountain, and... Uh, for me, it wasn't just like a physical trek. It was kind of, when I got there and I, I, I looked, you could, because where we were, we were in the hill stations of, of India. So you could still see across Dehradun and other parts of India where we were. And you could also see across the Himalayan mountains over the other side. And I remember when I was standing there, I just had my, the first epiphany I've, I've had, I think, in life. And I, I realized, one, the scale of the problem of extreme poverty like, you know, at that stage, 600 million people in India were homeless or slum dwellers. So, you know, I thought you have to take a different approach to it. That was my first kind of epiphany. And the second epiphany was just that I genuinely believe that us as human beings are capable of extraordinary things. You know, what made Mother Teresa special? What made, you know, Nelson Mandela special that he wanted to dedicate his life to eradicating, sorry, to ending apartheid? What made William Wilberforce special that he wanted to dedicate his life to abolish the slave trade in Britain? You know, what made these people special? Simply because they said, I'm going to give it my best. They weren't that special. They weren't individually different than you or I. Exactly the same. They just said, I'm going to go for it with everything I had. And a lot of them did start young. They started about the age of most of the audience here. You know, Nelson Mandela started when he was 27 years old, was when he really started to become a true activist. It was, you know, um, William Wilberforce was 26. Mother Teresa was 18 years old, a bit younger. But everyone had that common thing where they said, at one point, I'm going to go for it with everything I've got, even if it's a bit of an unorthodox path, even if it's not what most people normally do, I'm going to do everything I can to commit my life to that. And so that's what inspired me at that age and still does today. Yeah. Hey, I was wondering how you saw the development of Global Citizen Festival in, say, the next three or four years. That's an awesome question. Um, so we were, we were really honored when uh, Chris Martin said he wanted to help curate the festival. And we've also been really happy recently because two other really cool people have got involved. So uh, Ken Ehrlich, who's the producer of the Grammys, is our producer now. And um, also Richard Curtis, who's an amazing film director. He made films like Love Actually and, uh, and a lot of those uh, rom-coms featuring Hugh Grant. Um, uh, so he's now our creative director. And so we've got this really cool team, and, and uh, Beyonce's manager, um, Leanne, is, has recently become even more critically involved in Michelle Anthony from Universal Music and Jane Rosenthal from Tribeca Film. Um, they've all become more and more involved in the movement as it's grown. And so I think that there's a couple ways I see it evolving. One, uh, one it's going to go global. And so we hope, fingers crossed, to have a big announcement on stage at the festival this year about where we're going to be able to take the festival next year. We'll still do Central Park, but we're planning on taking it to one other place in the world also around the same time. Oh. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any hint on that one here? <laughs> You'll have to check don't, out my don't Instagram. Give it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're working very hard on that right now to be able to announce that. It's a lot of work going into that. The second thing we're working on is, for me, it's not about the number of actions, but about the quality of those actions. So like, I, I think a tweet is great, and tweets were very powerful when it came to Ernest Solberg last week. But I want to see people volunteering more. I want to see people. I want to see people um, actually able to go and spend time working in the developing world potentially through Global Citizens. So we're building partnerships now, so that the way that you earn your way into the festival will become increasingly um, more interesting and and more sophisticated. I don't want it just to be clicktivism. I want it to be anti-clicktivism. 
I want to get people, and motivating people can be hard, but I think Pearl Jam is a great motivator. And so, <laughs> and so given that they haven't played in New, York, New York City in years, a lot of the Pearl Jam fans are just going so hard right now to earn their way in. And so if we can make those actions even more sophisticated, then it's going to be even better. So what we're doing is we're working with our tech team right now to work out how do we use technology to automate some of the things we like to do. Like so volunteering, for example, can you check in? when you volunteer and use check-in functions on your phone so you can register that you're volunteering and how does that become validated. So we're working on all that technology right now to make the user experience so much better for global citizens who can take better and better actions to have a deeper and deeper impact on extreme poverty. Um, as for the festival itself, I think that what we also want to do is make the festival even more creative. So we want to work with our creative director like Richard Curtis. We want to work with Ken Ehrlich to see things that we can do that are revolutionary. So we're about to introduce for the first time this year something really cool backstage that I hope you get to see. It's the first time we've ever done it. And uh, I've, it's, it wasn't my idea. It was the idea of one of our mates, Andy Mendelson, who's the manager of Kings of Leon. And he, uh, he had this genius idea. I'll, I'll tell you guys about it first, but we haven't announced this yet. But so this is a first. Nice. So, there we go. <laughs> um, so so you know how back, I'm, I'm, I didn't live in the US growing up, but you know how back in the 80s there was Jerry Lewis was on the, on the TV always asking people to give money, right? He, was, he looked down the barrel of the camera and he said, you know, take action now, give money. Now people are used to giving their money now when they engage with charities, but we, we don't want people's money. We want them to take action because ultimately that, if they all take action together, they can raise far more money by encouraging the Prime Minister of Norway to give $100 million than they could raise just by giving a few dollars here and there. And so what we're doing, this, this wasn't my idea, it was Andy's idea, but for the first time this year, we're, instead of doing like, you know how they had, when, you, when Jerry Lewis caught up, you had like a whole bunch of influencers and celebrities sitting there answering the phones, to, you, know, you, know, you know, you might call in, you might get through to Leonardo DiCaprio and, uh, and you'll give $10. We said instead of doing that, let's have a global citizen action hub backstage where all the celebrities are sitting there still, but instead of, instead of asking for your money, they're asking for your voice and your actions. So every time you take a tweet on one of these, you might be retweeted by Leonardo DiCaprio instead, or you might be retweeted by Stephen Colbert who's sitting backstage, or they might actually respond to your action and encourage it to go viral on the internet that night. So if you take an action on Facebook, for example, or you volunteer, they'll promote your volunteering efforts. So all of a sudden, we can encourage people. To, it breaks the cycle for the first time where people stop thinking about just their money as their way in which they can give, but how they can use their time. Because time is a very powerful currency. And that's what we want to show through the Global Citizen Festival for the first time this year. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Hey, Hugh. Um, you're really inspiring. Um, I love sociology itself, so right now I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. can't believe someone's doing this. Anyway, um, do you consider yourself an activist, and do you have any future um, movements that you're, um, like, any ideas of your new movements in the future for your next Global Citizen Festival? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I like to think of myself as an entrepreneur um, because, because I like to start things. I like to, I like to see things grow and, and like to cr be creative. Um, some of our team members are far better at, at building it once we've got it off the ground than I am. And, and so we've got an amazing team. They're just a few blocks away in Soho, actually. About 100 of our team are there right now, and they're working away around the clock. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely an activist in the sense that I pe care passionately about the eradication of extreme poverty. And the good thing about extreme poverty, to your second question about future movements, is that poverty is interrelated with so many other issues. So, for example, it's interrelated with food security. It's interrelated with education, particularly for girls. It's interrelated with vaccines and immunizations to keep children alive beyond the age of five years old. It's also interrelated with water and sanitation efforts. It's also interrelated with gender equality more broadly and the empowerment of women. So how do you ensure that women are not discriminated against worldwide or that there isn't gender discrimination around the world? It's also about job creation. But then if you look a macro view above all those kind of uh, what I call interventions, it's also about how much aid do governments give and do they give it the right way? Is trade fair so that people can lift themselves out of poverty? 
And do we have good governance so that corruption doesn't flourish, so that people are not living in environments where corruption is preventing them from lifting themselves out of poverty? So all of these issues are actually under the banner of the end of extreme poverty by 2030. And so we see our role is essentially creating 100 or 1,000 micro movements under that big dream of the end of extreme poverty because all of those issues have to work into play for us to see an end to extreme poverty. If I just eradicated HIV AIDS, that would be a great achievement, but it wouldn't end poverty. And the reason why HIV AIDS contraction increases in poor, in, in poor environments is often cor correlated with education standards and other standards as well. So you need to think about the whole issue holistically, and that's what we're trying to do. Hey, we got someone right here. How's it going? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so glad I came today. This is you, awesome. You were laughing at us the most <laughs> when I talked about the crying on the plane. Because you didn't want to admit you guys are emotional, and we I are. have a very sweet <laughs> boyfriend, oh, oh, I'm, and I'm, I know <laughs> they have emotions. <laughs> what, what's your boyfriend's name? Demetrius. Shout out to Demetrius. Shout out to Demetrius. <laughs> Does he cry on airplanes is what we want to know. Yes. Um, so you touched on it a little bit, but I just really want to know how you solidified this idea of free concert, and we've got to get involved socially. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Okay, so you talk about how do, you mean how do users get involved? No, how did you come up with this idea? Like, how did you finally say, we're going to have a free concert, but everybody has to do something before they can get their free tickets? It's a, okay, so that cut, let's take it right back then. Okay, so 2011, we just moved to New York City. Um, at that stage, we weren't planning on doing the concert. We were running another campaign that Global Citizen does called Live Below the Line, where we challenge people to live on $1.50 per day for five days in food. Um, about 10,000 people around the world do that every year now. Um, and um, we're working on that campaign. And we, my, one of my friends, Ryan, also let me take a step even further back. First day I arrived in New York City, I was asked to speak up at Columbia University. So I had this speech um, with a bunch of social entrepreneurs there. And in the audience was this guy by the name of Ryan, came up to me afterwards and he said, I've got this dream to run a concert. I see you did concerts in the past. Could we work together? And so we came together um, as a, a small group of us, a, a great guy by the name of Don McKinnon, who was involved with uh, product Red, you know, Red, Red, which is uh, which, uh, Bono founded to combat HIV AIDS um, and the Support the Global Fund. Well, all of us came together in a small office at the time and we just started dreaming about what would it look like to really take this to scale. And we thought we had to do two things differently. One, we had to break the mold. So instead of just focusing on one issue, because most people focus on you know, just HIV AIDS or just the eradication of poly, we had to see if we could join the dots somehow so that people could, could see how each of their actions on one issue, like gender equality, could impact another issue like education, because they're directly related. And so we want to join the dots and get all of the best charities coming together under one umbrella called Global Citizen. That was the first objective. The second objective is we knew that if we asked for people's money, it would become totally transactional. So they would maybe spend $100 on a ticket, come to the festival, rock up and think, that's my contribution. I, I, get, I made a $100 donation. But really, that's not, that's not going to change the world. What will really change the world is if people are involved 365 days a year. So the concert just becomes like an impetus, a catalyst for a much wider engagement all year round. And so, so, this, so Don McKinnon and Ryan, we all sat together and brainstormed and, and, and they, we said, let's create it so that everything is driven digitally. You have to be able to verify it all digitally. The festival is just the starting point. It's like the pinnacle moment, if you will. It's like Christmas, you know, or Hanukkah. It's like... With Beyonce. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but what we were really excited about, and this is what we started working on with Pearl Jam, is we've now got this thing called Global Citizen Tickets, where year round now you can earn tickets to their shows wherever they are in the world. So when Pearl Jam is doing Wrigley Field, you know, you can now go there through Global Citizen. And uh, when Beyonce is in London, you can, you can earn those tickets to her show through Global Citizen. And there's amazing artists like Bruno Mars and, and, all the, and Jay Z, biggest artists in the world, have all committed two tickets to every single one of their shows worldwide. Um, for the next three years. And so the way that works is that now we're trying to build a 365-day movement. And I hope, my big dream, is that tickets will become irrelevant, that people will become so excited about their capacity to
to actually create change in the world and actually to end extreme poverty, that the tickets is just a bonus. You know what I mean? That the motivation comes through the fact that they're now literally changing the world and that we've, because now with six million members, we're getting the most amazing stories. This girl, Sarah, shared us her story last year. She told us an inspiring, inspiring story. She was, her family was on food stamps and she was so, uh, she felt embarrassed about that. But then when she learned about the fact that, you know, about a billion people go hungry in the world, it changed her whole perspective. Now she runs her local food kitchen. You know, she runs it and she actually uses that to gain points for Global Citizen. It was so inspiring. It made me think how the, the, the local activism that someone can make is connected with their global contribution as well. So anyway. Awesome. Well, please thank you. <laughs> Um, I just have to say it's been an honor chatting with you. I think Hugh is one of the real world leaders out there working genuinely and actually getting things done. It's been an honor to be your friend. It's been an honor to watch this, this whole thing grow. And, and I'm a believer that by 2013 we're going to end extreme world poverty, and I think you're going to be one of the the main catalyst behind it. So thank you again, Hugh, and thank you guys for joining us on AOL Build. Thank you.